The MMA Discussion Podcast is brought to you by SportsofAnarchy.com. Visit our site for all your sporting news and needs. We're also brought to you by SubmissionFC.com. Enter the promo code SportsofAnarchy10 for 10% off the best Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu gear. We're also brought to you by the Flex Belt. Summer is approaching fast, and if you want to strengthen and tone your abs, the Flex Belt, which is FDA cleared, might just be for you. Follow the link in the description below and get your very own. The MMA Discussion Podcast is now available to listen to on iTunes and the radio podcast app Stitcher which are both available for free on all smartphone devices. Ladies and gentlemen, we're back. Uh, what is it? March 9th now, coming in. Episode 25. 25, JP. Admin JP is here with us. It's just us two again. Say what's up, man. We're back. <laughs> we're back, just us two, shooting the shit again. I, I'm excited to have you on again, as always, JP. It's been a... It's a it's a MMA week uh week list event or it's an MMA list weekend. That's weird, right? Yeah. yeah With no, as many events as they've been pumping out, it's kind of funny not to have one for once. I think it's like when's the last time we didn't have one? First week of February. But then there was a Bellator event that week. No, that would have been that, that would have had to have been sometime back in uh January. October. No January. Yeah, Jan- uh, the set because there was a uh, January third, which oh, was right after. The- after that, there was that was that was the last weekend where we didn't have a, a MMA event from a major promotion like Bellator World Series of Fighting, and then uh, because February seventh actually had that Bellator event, Shmenko and Manhoff, and then all throughout, and then you had UFC Fight Night sixty with Benson, and then the next one with Mir, and then the next one with uh, one eighty four, and now this weekend where we don't have an event, it's kind of crazy, right? But this Saturday. Oh man, UFC 185 rolls around, and that's a crazy card. Uh, first of all, just going down the main card: Anthony Pettis versus Rafael dos Anjos will the uh, UFC lightweight championship fight, and then the co-main event: the first ever UFC strawweight championship defense by Carla Esparza. That's uh, uh against jo- Joanna Jedrzejczyk. I hope you know. Uh, just for anybody that's have, had a problem stating it, believe me, I probably didn't make it any easier. <laughs> You um, need to give her a nickname and call her Random J's. <laughs> and you actually pronounce. Yeah, man. She, yeah. That should be a great – that's a very big clash of styles. We'll get into that fight in a little bit. Uh, Roy Nelson versus Alistair Overeem. Big heavyweight fight there. That's going to be exciting to watch. Um, Henry Cejudo versus Chris Carriasso. That's another great fight. And – the biggest fight that I'm most looking forward to, believe it or not, on that card, Johnny Hendricks versus Matt Brown. That has fight of the night all over it. If, there's a few fights that do, but that's a contender right there for sure, right off the bat. Um, this card looks great. Which card? At, at, you know, also you have Sergio Pettis versus Ryan Benoit. And Sergio Pettis is finally going back down to flyweight, which is where he was before he came into the UFC. And I'm glad to see him go back down there, if, if you ask me. Um, I think he, he looked great back there before. I think he shakes things up at flyweight, especially uh, with the division being as shallow as it is right now. Uh, that's that's an exciting person to throw right in the mix. Uh, what what fight are you most looking forward to this card? Definitely the uh, Hendricks and uh, Matt Brown. I love seeing Matt Brown fight. Who does I mean, he gets that nickname, the Immortal for a reason that you can't stop him. Yeah. You can beat him down as much once you just can't stop that guy at all. Yeah, and, there, uh, it's it's not over till it's over with him. Never, you know? I'm a, I, I, that's the fight I, I can't wait to see. Personally, only because first of all, it's a big fight. It makes it it, it could make for the next contender at 170. Uh, already Johnny Hendricks has been promised a, a title fight should he win that fight. Um uh, I would think, though, if Matt Brown is able to finish Hendricks and or you know win in exciting fashion or a fight of the night candidate, what have you, uh, he could easily get back. He could easily be the next guy to to get in there I too. I can definitely see that happen if Roy McDonald somehow, some way manages to beat uh, Robbie Lawler in their fight. Well, I think it would make sense for Matt to get in there. Beating Johnny Hendricks, first of all, that's no small feat. Secondly, Rory lost to Robbie as well, and he's getting a rematch. So, um, yeah. Well, you know, that's what I'm saying. I can definitely see that happening if if, uh, if Rory loses. And oh, if he loses. Oh, I heard you wrong. Okay. My bad. 
No, I mean, yeah, if Johnny if Johnny wins and Rory wins, that's what I was meant to say. Mm-hmm. If Johnny wins and Rory manages to beat Robbie, I can see that I can see that match being set up for a title because it's a it's a new fight and uh, that would be great. That'd be really good to see. Wouldn't it be crazy to see uh, Rory win and then Matt Brown wins and then say they make that fight anyway? Who'd have, who'd have thought a year ago we could be possibly considering that the next title fight after this one in July could possibly be Rory McDonald versus Matt Brown? Yeah. That's crazy, right? Yeah. That just shows you how, how nuts welterweight is right now, but I love it. Yeah, because honestly, the fight between Matt Brown and Robbie Lawler, that was a crazy good fight. That was – yeah, both of them. Robbie Lawler's just exciting no matter what, man. Uh, you know, his fight with Roy was great. His fight with Matt Brown uh, Brown was m- much more exciting, but you know, both were exciting. So, yeah, it's just Robbie, man. That guy brings it and you know, you have to bring it to him to take the take, to get the win from him. You know, you really have to bring it. Yeah. That's just been the that's just the, the story with him in the last 5 years is that, you know, anybody he's lost to, they earned it. They had to work their way to a victory. There was a time where Robbie was just kind of you know, um, you know, about five years ago, I would say, where he was just out there. He was just there. He wasn't, you know, at nowhere near the level he's at right now. He wasn't fighting like he meant, you know, he wasn't fighting like he was going anywhere with it, you know? Yeah. Uh, kind of like he lost steam, but then somewhere along the line, got it back, and, and man, he's a world beater these days. Koscheck. Oh, yeah. Well, who's, who's he beating? He's beating Koscheck. He head kicked, uh, that one guy's head off. I'm trying to remember right now. Bobby Bolker, and then, um, then sure enough, put put Rory down uh, and gave him his second loss ever in the in the UFC, and uh, and then got and then you know that very close fight with Johnny, and then sure enough, last year had another crazy killer year. He's just man. Uh, I hope he holds on to that belt a long time. I really do. I hope he becomes the next GSP somehow. But but like. The, with the style that he has, I don't ever want him to change up because the, the fighter that he is right now is the best version of him we've ever seen, and I can just hope that he holds on to that, to that, yeah. uh, to the level where he's at right now. Yeah, I agree with that. He, he may never gain the notoriety that GSP had at welterweight, but damn it, I think he'd be a more exciting fighter to watch than GSP. No disrespect to GSP, he does what he does to win, but you know, watching. I get more excited to watch Robbie Lawler fight than I would against GSP any day of the week. For sure. I mean, and the thing about GSP was that, you know, um, he was just so much cut and dry better than everybody else in the grappling department yeah. and sometimes in the striking department. Like, he outstruck uh, Josh Koscheck. But I mean, that's yeah. a prime example. They both had wrestling under their belt, so it came down to, it came down to who could do something else different and better. And... Uh, GSP had that in spades. Yeah, and that, I mean that that in that aspect, seeing a guy pull off what he could pull off, thinking about it now makes me miss it a little bit. But with Robbie as champion, not so much actually. <laughs> it, it, you know, I mean, uh, Robbie's really taking a hand. I mean, with Johnny, it would have been the same kind of deal because he's always in exciting fights. You know, just like Robbie, so it didn't matter. But you know, with Robbie, it was more of like for him to come back from everything he's had to come back from. From from for as long as he's been in the game, you know, to where he's at now, the long stretch he really earned just being, you know, in the title picture altogether, and then to actually win the belt, it was actually pretty cool. Despite if you agree that he won that fight in his last fight, but either way, he's 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 where he's at right now because he certainly earned it, no matter what you say. Yeah, no, um, honestly, he could have won the he could have won the fight a year ago. Yeah, man. <laughs> on his way a year ago when he fought in Dallas. So, I mean, we were talking about that on our on our uh, group thread on Facebook. Uh, I don't remember exactly when it was, but you know, it, there hasn't been a decisive, clear-cut winner for the welterweight belt in the UFC ever since Hendricks lost to GSP. That's true. So, so yeah, I mean, I would say point. that one with Johnny and Robbie, the first fight was probably the closest... Or not the closest, like the the most uncontroversial of the three that have happened in the last three. Um, yeah. You know, I, I I don't believe Johnny uh, lost to GSP, and at the same time, it was so close that last fight that you really don't know who it could have gone to. I personally was leaning towards Hendricks, but at the same time, I was rooting for both men, so it didn't bother me too much. 
Um, yeah, I, I honestly think that they gave Johnny the belt just because of what happened in the uh, <laughs> but that's just me. Conspiracy, pe- conspiracy theory Fetterman on the loose right now. <laughs> <laughs> I think they just gave it to him to appease him for what happened in the fight before. Maybe, man. Who knows? But. I think their, yeah, I think their minds were already made up, and Johnny put on enough of a performance to warrant the win. So. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it really, I mean. After, hey, if you look at the fight after, that was definitely controversial. Johnny looked like he did a lot more. Um, In the uh, in the third fight? The, this past one at 181? Yeah. Yeah. It's certainly yeah. I mean, I I believe Robbie won the first one. He did more damage. Uh, the second round, I believe Johnny picked it up and started out striking him. And then in the third round, he used more wrestling. So he won those next two rounds. And then in that fourth round, it's that fucking fourth round, man. That fourth round is the closest round in MMA history because Agreed. Johnny takes him down. And then Robbie hurts him while he's on his back, but Johnny still stays on top and tries to transition in position to the point where the ref never really stood them up. I think he did it once, and then Johnny got him back down, and then they st- it stayed there until the be- until the next round. And jo- and Robbie kept doing what he was doing, attacking from the back, and then Johnny would attack from on top, but not as much. So it was just so close <laughs> that it was frustrating. You watch that fight again. You watch that fourth round, folks, and it will just give you a headache. Um, but that's the thing. Welterweight is exciting these days, and I like it. And Matt Brown, Roy McDonald in the mix. Tyrone's there right now. He's number three. Uh, <laughs> you know, so, I mean, it's just it's a matter of – that division is just always exciting. And Johnny's always exciting. Matt Brown's always exciting. For me, that's the fight of the night that goes down this weekend. Uh, other fight – I'm actually also excited to see how Carlos Sparza does. Uh, you know me. I'm a big women's MMA fanatic, so I'm, I'm excited to see – um, them on this platform, strawweight specifically, because they're basically the welterweight equivalent of excitement for women's MMA right now. Um, I believe they have the better personalities, the better fighting styles altogether. The division is very stacked. Um, I think in the next year, fans will come to see that. Um, and so I'm excited. And and the thing about that fight is going to be interesting is that Carla is fighting a very well-known striker who's undefeated. She's got a couple knockouts in her belt. Um, seems very tough. Um, as I said, her last name's hard to pronounce, but I'll try it again. Jedrzejczyk. I think that's how you say it. Um, very tough striker. I don't if she, but the thing is, if she can't stop that takedown. It's gonna be a, either a very short night or a long night. Neither of which are good for her. <laughs> you know. Um, so I mean I just that's the thing she better have worked that's she she should have worked on mostly in this camp. One of the things I remember hearing going into 184 from Kat Zingano was that she says I don't prepare for my opponents I just prepare to be the best version of myself I can be. I think you should do both. <laughs> um, yeah. In which this case you know because if Joanna's preparing to be the best version of herself she's not gonna win because she could easily win the striking. The battle, but then she loses the grappling battle. You know what I mean, and uh, that's where it's most important, almost, because that most of the time wrestling dictates where the fight is a lot of the time in MMA, which makes it one of the most important styles. So, uh, who who you got in that fight? Carla. Cut. Yeah, <laughs> she didn't even. Yeah. <laughs> Carla. Uh, she's just she has a way of doing whatever she wants in the cage, and uh, I don't know if Joanne can handle that. So. Uh, I've got Carla. From from her last fight in Invicta, for anybody that's seen it, from her last fight in Invicta, which was this is five round, very dominant wrestling based kind of win for Carla in her last in her last few wins in the Invicta FC where she defended the 115 belt. Um, she used a lot of wrestling, used decent ground and pound to really you know solidify each win, five round zip. You know she's done that and. Um, but this last fight with Rose Namajunas, she she looked almost like like Frank Yeager looked against Cub Swanson, where yeah. there was just such a clear amount of improvement that was just visible throughout the entire fight from her, as there was to Frankie when he fought Cub, you know. Um, and you know if she's continued that trend in this camp, in her in her in in training in general, ah. Uh, she she seems like she might become the next Ronda of her division, where she's just so dominant. 
You know what I mean? Um, Because that's scary. The fact that she was already a dominant wrestler altogether before coming into the UFC, and now she's got this incredibly more aggressive uh, ground game with her. Uh, It's just wow. You know, you know, uh, who knows what we'll see. But yeah, if if there's even a bit, a smidgen of improvement from that last fight, oh yeah, Joanna's in trouble. And uh, of course, the main event, which I'm excited for, and we'll get into it more. There's another podcast that will come out on Thursday, and we'll get into it more with uh, my co-host Chris Pagliuca. Shout out. Um, but uh, Anthony Pez versus Rafael dos Anjos, just a quick, who you got in that one? Um, I've got Anthony Pettis. I called that uh, RDA would get the title shot just before it actually happened <laughs> when he beat the, uh, beat Nate Diaz. But uh, Anthony Pettis is just unpredictable. You, you just can't tell what he's going to bring to you. He's excellent in striking. He's definitely a threat in the uh, ground game and his grappling submissions. Uh, you just don't know how this guy's going to come and get you. But he knows, and he's the only one that knows. And that's what makes him <laughs> most dangerous fighter at 155 right now most deaf so, yeah I, I have no I mean now RDA's been no slouch either you know he's got the uh, jiu-jitsu going for him but he's also been really really uh, showing his uh, striking chops lately you know knocking out Bendo which never happened before mm-hmm. and uh, you know playing almighty hands on Nate Diaz not knocking him out or anything but you know just Pounding away on him. Yeah, so. especially you know he he's a Muay Thai practitioner more than anything else, and um, yeah. he comes from that camp Kings MMA here in California. Trains with Leoto yeah. and Verdum and them guys, and has really you know improved that aspect of his game to the point where Most you know definitely. yeah, and uh, that's the thing, man. Rafael Cardero over there at Kings MMA, man, he's really making a, a stake as, as, as one of the coaches to, you know, to really train on these days. Yeah. yeah. Um, Anthony Pettis though, man, he is legit. One of the most exciting fighters, especially possibly and arguably the most exciting champion that we have right now next to maybe Rhonda Jones and uh, who else, you know? Um, I mean, all champs have their moments and stuff, but I mean, is there ever a boring moment when Anthony gets into that cage? Never. I don't think there is. You know? Never, ever. You know, same with Ronda, but, uh, you know, so I think, you know, it's them two that are the most exciting champs that we got going right now next to Robbie. I think Robbie also needs to be up there. But his, yeah. it's it's more so his, his fights that are exciting because he's just got this level of aggression that's just very – that's matched by very few. And, um, and Pettis, what he does is just – his skill level is just so – up there that he he tends to go out there and just you know he's so comfortable he's so flashy with everything that he does it's just that's the part of excitement that i mean that he can go in there and just do something so unpredictable with robbie you kind of know what you're getting with ronda and with him you don't know what you're getting some these days you know what i mean and that's the excitement factor that comes with watching some of his fights and um and man, you know, uh, John used to have that, but that that's kind of lost its muster in the last few fights. But but despite how dominant he's been, but that's just this the thing is that arguably to me he's one of the most exciting champions in the UFC right now. So who knows what we'll see from him? I mean, both guys, yeah, have him, have 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 tremendous striking. Dos Anjos with his Muay Thai has these killer leg kicks that I would just would not want to eat. <laughs> um, uh, the way he tore up Nate Diaz's legs in that fight, you know, ugh. yeah, that's that's gonna be a great fight. This whole card just looks freaking great and tremendous. Um, I'm excited, and uh, we'll get more into that on Wednesday. Um, you know, we'll move on. We actually got a, a lot of announcements that have happened in the last week. First of all, the Ultimate Fighter uh, season 21 gets a gets a gets a new coat of paint, I guess you could say. This is the new style that the Ultimate Fighter season 21 is gonna have. We're going to have two camps, very prominently known, the Black Zillions and American Top Team, uh, and they're going to go off on each other. There's there's a wel- – uh, what is it? Welterweight and middleweight or welterweight and lightweight? Let me look. Welterweight and lightweight. And they're going to go – and they're going to go uh, – they're going to do a tournament. Winner gets a, a half a million dollars for their camp and the Ultimate Fighter trophy. And I would assume – the way that this works is whoever advances farthest into the tournament also gets a UFC contract. 
I would figure. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, last fight of standing probably, or the you know last two maybe probably get a contract depending on how they look. Um, there's a lot of notable names on here. Steve Carl, former World Series of Fighting welterweight champ. You got uh, one of the um, Encha Kawani brothers in there moving up to lightweight. Usually fights at featherweight. Or, well, yeah. or no, he fights at welterweight. I'm tripping. Um, How about Chitty? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of notable names on here. Look it up. Another uh, And the coaches uh, actually have a, a history with each other. The coaches of each gym. They're, uh, you know. Uh, so there's a story there. I like how it's going. I like how it looks. It looks interesting. Um, I, I, and the, the fighters don't have to live in a house, as far as I understand, um, yeah, with the with the other team and shenanigans take place and such. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah for that reason, I just might watch it just because I hated that. I hate the whole reality show aspect of Ultimate Fighter. Personally, I, I don't watch it for that reason. Yeah, uh, so. I'll watch the fights and all, but I I have no interest in watching. Yeah, here's here's how here. For the cameras and stuff, that's this just bullshit. Yeah. So here's the new way it's gonna work is that, of course, the the, the fighters are set, so you know they uh, they do. I guess the the, the um, episode first one will start this way. They'll pick um, the brackets. I guess the fighters will be ranked from their own coach's gym from their own coach, which got to be kind of hard. But <laughs> for a coach yeah. to have to rank all of his guys, it's got to be a little weird. Um, but you know they get to rank them, so you never know. They could just rank their 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 weakest link to the top if we really wanted to, because then it would because then it would take on the least ranked guy of the other team. And so you know, I mean, there there could be a lot of head games with coaches going on, which is actually kind of smart. It's like almost like like you know calling a play at the same time with how you make the the brackets and the tournaments and then with each win you get to pick uh um you know where the where, there's going to be three venues they could do it at a ufc one their own gym or the opponent's gym and uh, yeah. i don't think the other t- the coaches would ever pick the opponent's gym but they can pick e- either gym which uh is kind of interesting um so there's a lot of new aspects to this season of the Ultimate Fighter that makes it look exciting to me. Uh, I'm interested. Uh, you guys kind of uh, kind of fish hooked me there. I'm I'm interested. I want to see how it goes. I would have watched it if it was just another coach versus coach thing, just because I'm a sap like that. But I agree that it was getting to a point where it was staling out, and so to give it this new fresh coat of paint is uh, is I like it. Uh, another Ultimate Fighter show that's getting uh, getting its second season, Tough Latin America, which uh, is again gonna it's weird because it's gonna have Kelvin Gastelum coaching against Efren Escudero, obviously because of the weight difference. The guys will not fight. Um, yeah. They're just gonna be coaches, and they speak Spanish, so it, just, it makes sense. Um, it'll be the same system as last year: Team Mexico versus Team Central or Team you know Latin America from both Central and South America. Um, and I like that. I like the way that that works. You know, you got uh, a whole following of team from Mexico and then a whole following of team from uh, another uh, uh, – from countries all over Latin America. And I like that. And for me specifically, I'm, of course, I'm Ecuadorian and Nicaraguan and there's uh, both Central and South America's uh, countries. So I, I, I enjoy watching those guys fight too. They put on great fights. If you missed last season of The Ultimate Fighter Latin America – Go watch it, man. Those guys put on great fights, especially they they did um, so for UFC 180 when they did the events in Mexico and crowned the winners and all that. Um, those guys put on great fights, no? I don't know if you remember that card. Oh, yeah. I remember that one. Yeah, man. So go then. Yeah, that was where, uh, that was where um, Gaston got that nice submission win over uh, Ellenberger, wasn't it? Ellenberger, yep. That was yeah. the one where Verdum – you know, became Superman with his knee, <laughs> launched it into the center of Hunt's face. <laughs> I think about that fight, man, and I just get bummed out because you know I was going for Hunt. I like Verdum; he's a cool dude, and I and, I, and I'm certainly a, a fan of his as well. But I, you know, I wanted Hunt to win that, well, because that would have been similar to Robbie Lawler's kind of story. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And he was winning that fight too. That's the crazy thing is he was win- beating Verdum at least up to that point. It was it was early on in the fight, but he won that first round, and uh, and was and was seemingly winning that second round up until the knee. You know, so that's crazy. We've also had some fight announcements come on. First of all, we'll go on to the freshest one. 
Uh, Josh Koscheck, who recently fought at UFC 184, which was what from our time now only eight days ago. Um, <laughs> um, that's crazy. And he's taking a fight on short notice, which is going down March twenty fourth. No, twenty fourth, twenty first. Um, against Silva. So that's literally twenty one days later. Which is weird because you would think after getting submitted that there'd be more time he'd have to get cleared for that fight. But um, yeah. I would think you know the UFC would have done their due diligence by now and made sure that he would he would be cleared for that fight. So, but that's crazy. So here's a here's the more interesting thing because it sucks because that fight was originally Ben Saunders versus Eric Silva, which right there, whoa, big fight, you know. Um, so it sucks that that fight got thrown out, but it's just as interesting in the sense that this is Josh Koscheck's last fight of his contract and having won what he having gone one and five in his last six you find it hard to believe that he would get another contract and if he did it wouldn't you would he, he wouldn't be getting paid what he's getting paid now you know what i mean yeah so many to me i would believe and koshek has said it in the past that he would retire with the ufc so if this is his final contract with them this is potentially his retirement fight um, and that's kind of sad, but at the same time, I, I got to commend him for taking on a, such a tough dude on such short notice. Um, but I don't like his chances here. Oh, <laughs> uh, no, but I mean, this would be the first time Eric Silva strings together any wins in his UFC career if he wins. So, I mean, you could very easily see, uh, Eric Silva lose this fight too. Yeah, what, what, did he win his last fight? Who did he beat in his last fight? He beat... He did win his last fight. He did? Yeah, he won his last fight. Kunimoto, I believe, right? No, no, no. Let's look. I don't, know. I don't want to make get it wrong. Oh, yeah, he beat Mike Rhodes with that arm triangle. I just remembered in December. Uh, yeah, well, let me see. He's... Damn. He's, he's lost and won consistently since his debut. One loss, one loss, one yeah. loss, one yeah, he's never, loss. He's never, won. he's never had a win or lose. So he, he won his win. last fight, so. Yeah, so odds are he's going to lose. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if Koshek knows that. <laughs> That's probably why he took it. He's like, oh, you know, karma's on my side. Huh? Yeah, here's the thing about Eric Silva. If he doesn't get it done in the first five minutes, he's going to drop the fight. Maybe. That's That's usually how it works. Yeah, all of his wins. One, two, three. Yeah, every UFC victory he has was achieved in the first round. Every loss, Matt Brown in the was third, Dong Young Kim in the second, second John Fitch, was decision. Was a round finish or a decision? Yeah, not Matt Brown. <laughs> that was oh, a yeah, that was a fourth round finish. Yeah, and the Carlo Prater one, that was actually a DQ, which – yeah, yeah, that's probably the one yeah. inconsistent thing because he beat Luis Ram Luis Ramos in his debut. That was a knockout, and then he yeah. hit Prater with a knee, and then hit him with these punches where Mario Yamasaki said it was at the back of the head, which I don't think many agreed with. I didn't think they were either. And then no. he, yeah, and then he submitted Charlie. So that that could you know essentially be three wins, but it's just the karma hitting him here with you know back to back to you know back and forth between wins and losses. Yeah. So we'll see. I don't know. I mean, yeah, karma's kind of on, you know, Josh's side here. But, I mean, let's talk about that for a minute. What, just looking back on Josh's career, the guy has always been a great competitor. He's always been a dick, but, you know, <laughs> that's just kind of been the personality of him that he's brought to the table. It doesn't mean necessarily mean that that's him. But he's had a crazy great career, and if this is his last fight in the UFC – when we get there, we'll find out and we'll talk about it. But at, just for now, I've got to commend him on taking on a tough dude. Silva undoubtedly is a tough dude. Uh, you know, fights where he's expected to win, he generally wins. He wasn't expected to beat Matt Brown. He, um, and uh, as far as Dung Young Kim, that could have gone either way as well. That was a closely knit fight it's in itself. John Fitch, that was his first big test, you know. That was, um, yeah, that was his first real loss. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, so, you know, I mean, he's lost to some – He's. it's not like he's losing to chumps. So, um, yeah. and with Josh Keck – with Koscheck being a name, Josh Check. <laughs> Josh <laughs> <laughs> With With him being 
you know, the name that he is, you know, I would just, you know, it, it almost be heartwarming to see him rise to the occasion in his last fight and get a win and, and ride the, ride the horse out on a, on a victory, but we'll see. Um, either way, what do you think? Right. You know, you know how I feel about Kostrak. I don't want to get into that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Who do you, who do you think wins that though? Just with that. If I have, without, without any, you know, personal feelings or, you know, yeah. You know, I see Eric Silva getting it done in the first round somehow, some way. Because, I mean, look, Kostrick just had it. He's not there anymore, you know. He, he, yeah, he beat Matt Hughes. That's probably going to be his biggest win after, you know, losing to GSP. And that's going to be that. Okay. I don't think he's going to beat Eric Silva. Yeah, I don't think so either. Chris believes that Koscheck will get the decision. Or Chris, uh, Mr. Katana. <laughs> um, you know, he has every reason in the world to think so. Because that's just how, that's how it goes. If, you know, the odds are if you get past five minutes with Eric Silva, you're going to win the fight. That's just the thing. And I wonder if that's the kind of game plan he goes in there thinking, you know, just, uh, just survive to five minutes. Just survive five right. minutes. Don't even engage yep. five minutes, you know. Survive five minutes and do what you do. Yeah. We'll see. I would think Eric could be smart enough to, to you know, but at the same time, I've said that the last three fights, so maybe I should just shut up at this point. Uh, <laughs> because when he was supposed to fight Matt Brown, people said, oh, cardio is going to be an issue. Cardio is going to be an issue. And it was, but only because Matt Brown made it an issue. He came forward and pressed the – he he Matt Browned him, all right? You know, and when <laughs> when Matt Brown, Matt Brown's people, it's because he's coming forward and getting in your face and, you know, attacking you with a pace that's just so hard to really go through. The fact that it took him three rounds to get it done is impressive in and of itself for Silva. So, um, you know, yeah, I don't – Yeah, but Silva had, Silva had some nice – critical hits on uh on brown too fight. yeah he started that fight off that fight off per- perfectly i mean if he if he yeah yeah i mean if he could have just finished matt brown off but that's just a, a, you know attributed to matt being a the tough son of a bitch that he is you know yeah and, you know. yeah but i mean he had quite a few opportunities to keep you know keep the pressure on that weak spot yeah, oh, he did. He kept trying to kick it, but it seemed like Matt didn't wasn't as affected by it after that point. Oh, he ate so. two of them. They they hurt him real bad. Oh, you could tell they hurt him. He just didn't go down the second time. He did go down the second time. Did he? I gotta rewatch yeah. that fight. That's an yeah, exciting fight. So I gotta rewatch it. Maybe he did. Yeah. See, that's the thing is Eric Silva's got. I mean, that's just Matt Brown. If if he puts Koscheck down like that, chances are Silva will be able to get the finish. Yeah. He, yeah. He already was dealing with something in there, in his stomach anyway, if I remember correctly. Well, he said he came out to the fight cold, which means that, you know, he didn't work his body out before, just before, you know, just kind of getting a, 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 a decent heart rate going, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. Which he didn't do, so he said his stomach was cold, which means it hurts a little more to get hit there. Um That's- so either way, but still, I mean, that just shows you how tough Matt Brown is. I don't really – there's not been much of of those kind of comebacks for Koscheck in his last few fights. It's not like he's ever been hurt and then that made a comeback, you know. When he gets hurt, generally guys are able to finish him. So um, we'll see. I mean, uh, I, I think that there, there are points in this fight Koscheck can win. And at the same time, I kind of want to see if he can – uh, uh, if he can really ride out this bitch uh, on a positive note, you know, with all these guys that retire, it's it's nice to see some of them go out on wins. Um, so, you know, one of the heartbreaking ones for me are Chuck Liddell and Randy Couture. <laughs> the fact that those guys went on on losses bums me out sometimes. Hey, you know, it's it's usually the way it goes, man. I mean, yeah, where they can't, they just can't get it done in there anymore. You gotta be really fortunate to go out on a win in uh, combat sports. Yeah, that's why you know, for me, and he's one of my all-time great favorites. Uh, is Chris Lytle. That dude made it smart, yeah. man. Yeah, that was nice. Mm-hmm. To go out on such a big win with a big bonus and big check, and go, hey, fuck y'all, and hey, I'm out here. <laughs> wasn't that a wasn't that a tribute to uh, Coach Tompkins? Who? 
the coach. Oh, Tom Sean Tompkins. Tompkins. Um, Chris Lytle for Sean Tompkins? I think it was. No, nah, Sean Tompkins it. runs a gym in Canada, and, and Chris Lytle always trained in uh, where, where's Indiana, where he's from. Well, yeah. I thought he dedicated that fight to Sean Tompkins. I believe Mark Hominick, delete, uh, you know, after he passed away, did that for every fight. Uh, I'm sure there are other Canadian fighters like Sam Stout who still does it. Um, yeah. That uh, that still you know pay homage each time they walk out to him. So yeah, it's kind of crazy. You're starting to see all these these old guys, not old even, but just you know they've been around these veterans, I should say, yeah. like uh, Jamie Varner and Ease Edwards and and uh, there's a couple others that are uh, that are, oh Leonard Garcia and. Yeah, there's been a few. There's there's been a few fighters in the last year or so that have just retired and. Yeah, the old guards on their way out, man. Yeah. Kind of sad to see, but that's, that's the way it all goes. <laughs> yeah. That's the way it goes, man. Yeah. Well, we'll see what happens with Koscheck. He might be, you know, like I said, this could be potentially his last fight, unless he probably, if he doesn't get a new contract. And he doesn't retire, then you know. Obviously, I would think his options. He's got some options outside of the UFC. I'm sure Bellator would be silly and pick him up, <laughs> um, which I guess isn't bad for Koscheck. But that's just you know that goes against the point that we were making last week when we were talking about him. But uh, we talked enough about that. Another matchup made up in the welterweight division: Dung Young Kim versus Josh Berkman. That's a good fight. I like that fight. Um, there's a lot of fights been announced for the welterweight. Uh, for the welterweights. It's pretty exciting. I like it. Dong Young Kim finally coming back after that loss to Tyra Woodley at the uh, UFC Fight Night China card last year. Coming against Josh Berkman, who suffered technically a loss to Lombard, but Lombard tested positive for for PED, so that might get butched to no contest. So um, we'll see what happens. I, Josh Berkman, first of all, I was surprised he survived all three rounds with a roided up Hector. <laughs> Um, now that you think back on it, but this should be interesting. Who do you got in this one? Okay, so I don't think Berkman's a bad fighter at all. Uh, he's got quite a record, and uh, I also like uh, Dong Young Kim. He, you know, lately he's just been really exciting to watch. Uh, this could go either way, but I am going to pick Dong Young Kim in this fight. I, I like him a little more. I like I like the way he's going these days. Yeah, I mean that this is another ranked opponent for uh for um for Josh. Yeah, so I mean that, that's a that's good for him. I mean I'm glad that he doesn't steep step down the ladder after that. What will probably be turned into a no contest uh to Hector. Um, I think it may have already been turned to that. Actually. It's already overturned. Has it been? Yeah. yeah it's been overturned. Cool. Yeah, so that's good. That means he comes in with a probably clean slate, I would say, you know, um, and gets yeah. another ranked opponent. I like it. That's That makes sense, and it's fair. Um, I don't like how he fought against Hector, though. While he, while I commend him for surviving three rounds against a roided Hector, I think that, you know, his style, and he was very tentative in there, and that might have just been because Bert, or Hector is Hector. Um so I mean he just needs to be more comfortable in there because he just I think did not. He will be. <laughs> I, I think he will be. I mean, you know, Kim's another guy who's all of a sudden developed the knockout power, but um but I would think, yeah, you you're not as scared of getting knocked out by Kim as you are Lombard, so Right. We'll we'll see how he goes in there, how he looks, but yeah, until you know, until the fight comes around and I start seeing how Berkman looks starting off, I gotta say Dung Young Kim probably probably wins this. And who knows? He might also slew back down to using utilizing that judo of his that's that's really allowed him to to um to to succeed in there mostly. You know, Dung Young Kim I think has lost very few fights. Um I think he's only lost two. So Props to Berkman, though. Apparently, he dated uh, Ariana Celeste at one point. <laughs> Look at that. According to his bio here. <laughs> the lucky bastard. Ah, oh, there's a bunch of dudes right now that are like that. Fucking. <laughs> hey, guys, don't be mad. He, he's not dating her anymore. Yeah. <laughs> he lost her, so. Yep. He can't oh, okay. be that great, right? 
So yeah, Dung Dung Kim has lost to Carlos Condit. I forgot about the flying knee. Um, Damian Maya, which was kind of a free accident-ish kind of thing anyway. And then Tyron Woodley, which was another very clean knockout. So, uh, so you know, three losses, all ranked guys. So, I mean, it's not like Dung Young Kim is an easy guy to put away. If Berkman does win, it would be the first unranked opponent Dung Young Kim has ever lost to. So that's a that's a tall order for uh, for Berkman to, to match up with. But then again, you know, like I said, he's, he should count himself lucky to get another ranked guy. That's a great fight. Another fight that is rumored thus far, it's targeted, it's out there. Carlos Condit versus uh, Tiago Alba is set for UFC Fight Night 67, I believe. Uh, again, it hasn't even been uh, announced yet, so this is pure speculation. But if that fight does happen, which, God, I hope it does, that would be great. Um, I got to say, I honestly actually want to see what you have to say first. JP. Uh, Thiago Alves and Carlos, Carlos Condit. Condit. Yeah. God, Carlos Condit, last time I saw him fight was about a year ago. And and uh, I think that was the last time he fought out, actually. Um, you know, Condit always brings it. I am a little concerned about his injury. Uh, that, that ACL is no joke. Uh, once those start getting torn and ripped up and all that kind of stuff, they kind of tend to continue to get torn and ripped up and all that kind of stuff. So it's not like a bone that, you know, when it heals, it gets stronger. We're talking about ligaments and such. And those never heal back properly. They never come back the same. Yeah, look at Cruz. So, yeah, uh, I am concerned about that. As far as that, that doesn't take anything away from Tom's ability to fight. He is a good fighter. The damn good fighter. Uh, and Thiago Alves, you know, I haven't really been inspired much by him lately either, you know. Well, uh, he's, he fights so far in between each fight, you know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. He's uh, fought three yeah, times well, in the last three years. That's one time for fight. That's crazy. Alves just beat uh, Jordan Main, didn't he? Yeah, very, very big comeback win. That was uh, a nice comeback win. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he lost that, that first round. Yeah, he, he lost that first round uh, to Mean and then just came back in the second with a body kick from hell and put the, yeah. put the young stud down. Um, yep. Which, you know, and that's two wins in a row for Alves. Prior to that, yeah. he'd lost to Campman back in, like, 2012 or, right. or some, some – yeah, 2012. So, the way I see this fight is it's a, it's a fight between guys that, you know, have kind of been not very active lately. Except for, you know, not consistently and regularly. If you want to call uh, guys like Donald Cerrone and Benson Henderson on one of the – you got the other end right there with uh, guys like uh, – guys that are fighting in this fight, uh, Condit and Alvis. But, mm -hmm. you know, they are exciting to fight, watch when they fight. i just like to see more of them and you'd have a better idea. I mean, there are people – we we've watched them for years. So there are people that are new to the sport watching nowadays, and you know you have to do some research on who these guys are nowadays. Um, I like. I'm picking Condit in this fight. Believe it or not, I am picking Condit in this fight. Even though uh, Alvis looked really good, uh, managing to come back against Jordan Mean just at the end of uh, January, so that's my pick for that one. For me, I gotta say that uh, I think Alves. You know, first of all, it's a good thing that he's coming back quick off of that meme. What was that? That's oh yeah, that was in late. That was, that was basically the beginning of February, and yeah. that fight should happen in May, early May, which is pretty good. Like about three months spread out. That's a that's a good and this is a great fight. This is, this could main event on fight night if it wanted to. Both guys are really. Uh, Exciting to watch, as we as we said, and you know, promoting that fight would not be a big deal with these two. And um, what what I like about Alves is that he seems to have recovered from all injuries. Looks all right. He looked a little slow against Mean starting off, and that could be attributed to the ring rust. Um, and who knows if we'll see that with Condit. Condit is the one guy you'd worry about seeing that from, as Alves, like we said, fought a month ago, and so. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it, it's really dependent, and it, it would be it would be a lot more funner to call this fight if, uh, if uh, you know, both men had just got off a win or something. Um It'd be more fun. It'd be more fun to think about. Okay, they won this way, or they thought this, or you know. But the ring rust. Whenever I have to factor that in, always sucks. Um, so for me, I, I got to. I'll go with Alves. I think that he pulls it off uh, with an exciting fight of the night win, and gets maybe a decision if it's a three rounder. If it if it ends up being the main event of that fight night card, which I don't know if it will be. Um, but if it is, if it's a five rounder, I'd probably lean more towards Condit. Um, but if it's a three rounder, I'm gonna go with Alves. Yeah, and I hope that makes sense as to as to why. Yeah, yeah, I <laughs> definitely understand why. Yeah. I totally understand why you make that. This is a, yeah, I mean, it's a, it, a, those are all the welterweight fights that we've got going that that have been announced in the last week. I'm excited for them. That just shows you how how fun welterweight has gotten, man. It's gonna be great. I can't wait. I can't wait for May. Oh, May. It's going to be so much fun. That May UFC 187 card, if that isn't the most stacked card of the year right there. Um, you got Anthony Johnson, John Jones, Chris Weidman, Vitor, Cerrone, Khabib, Benavidez, uh, Moraga, I believe, um, Mikofsky and Dodson. Yeah, oh, God. That card, that card is just, uh, just mwah. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> there are yeah, some... Man. There's some other fights to watch for this month, too. I mean, March is an exciting month. First of all, you got Bellator 135 going down at the, the end of the month. You got Joe, Joe Warren defending the bantamweight Bellator title um, against against uh, Jorge Mal, Malvoa. And I know that doesn't sound like such a particularly remembrant name, but he is an exciting dude to watch. One of these jiu-jitsu guys that has Muay Thai and if they if Bellator gave out fight of the night bonuses, this guy would have won some by now. Um, Joe Warren is always exciting to watch, and so is Eduardo Dantes, who's going to be in the co-main event. Uh, again, this will be Bellator 135, March 28th, at the end of this month. And then you got World Series of Fighting, who will be fighting for ratings that night against uh, against Bellator with World Series of Fighting 19. Headlined by Justin Gaethje and Jorge Patino. Now, if and if you uh, are an avid watcher or viewer, I mean, of uh, World Series of Fighting, that is a great main event. Especially with guys like Gaethje. I don't know if you watch Gaethje too often, JP, but man, that dude's exciting to watch. Yeah, yeah, I've seen Justin Gaethje fight. He's to me right now. He's the equivalent of Pettis in that he's so exciting to watch and he's so effective. He's he's one of these aggressive guys. He fights like Robbie with the effectiveness of like say Weidman if he was much faster. <laughs> like yeah. he uh he's got great wrestling. He's got the striking style that's just wow. You know, aggressive as hell. If he gets you against the cage, it's almost about over. And on the and he can still fight and, and he can still fist the cuff with you in the middle of the ring and not be scared to exchange and brawl with you. Um, he's a ballsy dude, and thus far, it's it's equaled nothing but success for him. He's fourteen and zero, I believe. Uh, yeah. That's just man. He's a guy to watch out for. And having already beaten Nick Newell and Melvin Gillard, two of probably your your most uh uh your uh, your most popular guys on in the lightweight ro- uh roster of that promotion, that's an exciting fight. There's all kinds of exciting fights. This pay per view, this the the Bellator card, the World Series of Fighting card. I uh, and then UFC Fight Night 62 going down with Koscheck and Silva and Maya and Laflair. That's an odd main event for me, but you know we'll see how it goes. Yeah. I have a question for you. Okay. You, um, first of all, it's it's about the cyborg situation, so I know it's not like uh, anything new, but. There's been a point where Ronda said at one point, if Dana White says that he wants the fight to be at 140, I'll fight her at 140. So that is making people assume that the fight should just be done at 140. I don't believe that it should, and I have my own reasons for it, which I'll say, but I just want to get your thoughts on what you think of that. I'll, I'll put it this way. Um, Ronda basically has to fight if Dana says she does. Now, 
whether that's at 140 or 135, I don't think it should make much of a difference. Um, Ronda has fought at 145 before. So, you know, or she's competed in judo at 145 before, so. Yeah, her first two fights in the, uh, or maybe first four. Her first four fights in MMA were all featherweight. Yeah, so she's fought at 145 before. Uh, now granted, I, I kind of saw where you're going to go with it. I don't want to say too much about it. But, you know, hey, this is, the UFC is Ronda's house as far as, you know, women's fighting goes. So if, if that fight's to be made, uh, I don't see why it shouldn't be made to accommodate Ronda. Ronda's the champion. Ronda's been the one that's done more for the UFC. Uh, and if Cyborg thinks she's bad enough to beat Ronda, then she needs to do it on Ronda's terms. I don't even see it as Ronda's terms. I just see it as, you know, more so the UFC's terms, I guess, in a, in a, in a, in a simpler way to say it. I just don't – I don't think it's Ronda's terms. It's Ronda's division. She's the champ. And yeah. the thing about it also is that if it happens at catchweight, so what? If – what happens after this fight? Where where does Ronda go? If she loses, she keeps the belt, obviously, because it wouldn't be for the belt. But yeah. then she goes back to a division having lost to a chick that literally would have only fought for the promotion once because she's not fighting at 135, which is the division that they have. You're basically yeah. telling Cyborg, all right, we'll bring you over 140. You're just going to fight once against Ronda. What's the point of that? So she can go back to Invicta with a win over Ronda, and then, you know, that, that helps Invicta a lot. That doesn't help the UFC at all. Yeah, if she stands, they stand to gain nothing out they of that. They gain nothing out of that. You know what I mean? Well, I mean, it's not like there would be other chicks at 135 that would say, hey, I'll take your girl on at 140 or something like that. They're, they're not going to do that. They're <laughs> just not. I mean, unless somebody's ballsy enough to do it, but you really think anybody else is going to call her out at um, and that's the thing is that it just it benefits nobody. Of course, fans just want to see it, and if it has to happen at 140, they're like, okay, cool. But the UFC is never going to do that. They're, and so I, that's why I think Ronda felt confident enough to say if Dana wants to, you know, cool. But that's what makes me think, you know, she knows that it benefits her nothing. It benefits the UFC nothing. If it happens at 135, it benefits everybody, even Cyborg. You know, yeah. if she can make the weight, if she can make the weight, she loses to Ronda, worst case scenario, she gets to fight for the UFC still and fight other chicks at 135 who I'm sure she'll slaughter and then get a rematch. You know what I mean? Because um, it's those two chicks. They are the two best women fighters on the planet right now, hands down. Carla's catching up to them, but, uh, you know, it'll take a few years till she's there. And, yeah. but right now it's just about those two chicks and sure enough, it's become this thing where it's like, you know, with other divisions, you got Kane, you got your Kane Jones and, you know, your, uh, your wide, your, your Silva GSPs where we've seen it before. It's always been a d issue weight, you know, and, um, I don't know what I mean. I, I still don't believe that this fight is ever going to happen, but. You know, in the meantime, I don't think that that's a problem anyway because there's still – first of all, Ronda's not going to be back until maybe fall of this year anyway because she's going to go out and film a movie. So that gives, you know, other fighters like Jessica I and Holly Holm and even Besh Carrera a chance to really build more because, first of all, Correa, even though I would say if Ronda had to fight somebody next, I would say it's her, it, it, it'd probably be beneficial for that fight in general. For her to get maybe one more win, especially against somebody ranked. Like, personally, I'd like to see Betch either fight Jessica I and knock a contender out, which is beneficial and, and not beneficial at the same time, or fight Misha Tate. You know, I think that fight does a lot, but at the same time, Misha Tate gets rid of another contender, and then uh, she's already lost to Ronda twice. If we see that fight again, it would really have to be under extraordinary circumstances. Um, yeah, I agree. So, but see, that's just the thing is that, you know, that division still has names and women who are still willing to get in there and, and whoop some ass and try and make a name for themselves and make a sellable fight. There's still, there's time to do that now. Ronda's not fighting get, uh, for about a season and a half. So just, you know, the, hopefully those women get in there and get, and, you know, just, oh, I can't wait. You know, Jessica I's fighting, or no, 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 Sarah Kaufman's fighting Alexis Davis next. You have uh, 
Jessica I, who's waiting to hear an announcement, I guess, according to her, this Saturday. Um, I mean, we'll see, man. I mean, there's still a lot of names that, that Ronda can still fight. There's still a division there that Ronda still has to pay attention to. So with Cyborg, unless she gets down to 135, it's on her. It's on her to make this fight happen. If she wants it, get it. You know what I mean? That's the thing. One of the things, one of the best quotes I heard was actually from Jessica I. And, and and she put it in context like this. If you're if you're cyborg, you're basically saying, hey, I want that cake. Bring me that cake. Why? You're the one who wants the cake. Go get it. It's your cake. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, that makes the best sense. That's the best way of putting it because there's – first of all, many people look at her like people look at Vitor right now. Dude got popped before and there's a reason he gets tested a lot, right? Because of that, he's been popped before. He used to be on TRT, and now he's bitching and moaning about the fact that he gets test drug tested more so than why. <laughs> um, Cyborg, who's been popped before, and then one was and was given a UFC contract, and then walked away from that contract when she heard testing was coming around, and then not only that, could have stayed just even to fight at 145 they would have made a fight for her they announced that about a year after she was gone that they would have made a 145 fight for her though that wouldn't have earned her a shot at that ronda she still didn't take it that's very weird for me you know and it, again it, it makes me understand why they don't want to accommodate her in any sense you know what i mean if she can make the weight they're gonna sign her but that's if she can make the weight and i don't know if she can make the weight but we'll see i hope she can make the weight I hope that fight happens. I really do. That's just my rant about it for now. You want to answer some questions? Yeah. Let's do it. I got some uh, questions on Twitter from some of the fans that have uh, sent me messages on Twitter to put on the podcast. You loyal listeners, you. I love you guys. Uh, First question. Um, CM Punk recently competed in a uh, three-round scrimmage. Uh, Duke Rufus – he spelled this wrong. Duke Rufus explained, except for he didn't put an X in it, uh, <laughs> explained that he his grappling and striking both need work and that he did all right. How do you think that he does and when do you think he does fight? Well, I didn't see it, so I can't comment on that. Just going off what Duke Rufus said, um, uh, I do remember the – the the striking comments Duke made and uh, he fought against a guy who will be unnamed for now because I don't recognize him and I don't know who he is and Duke didn't give us his name uh, but he's four and zero according to Duke and uh, that's a decent record that's probably around the kind of record a guy like CM Punk will probably fight in his his debut um, when will he fight I'm not sure probably at the end of this year or the beginning of next year that makes the most sense for him I think what about you you know, uh, I'm just going to say it. I, I thought CM Punk joining the UFC was a joke. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't expect him to do very, very well. I'm just being flat out, straight up honest. I, I'm not surprised. You're not the only one who thinks this is cool. Yeah. I'm, I I don't think he – I think it was all just a big money grab on Zufa's part and a big money grab on CM Punk's part. You know, he, he needs something to do. So he said, hey, fuck it, I'll just join the UFC. So I, I really don't take him seriously. I have a question for you. I'll, yeah, go ahead. I have, here's a question from me to you because we're both fans of him. So if what what if they decided to go all pride, you know, like pride FC, and just right, right. and make a freak fight with him and the Green Ranger, Jason David Frank? What, what would oh, you? Oh, God. I know. Okay, what would your thoughts God. be on that? What? <laughs> We talked Punk's about this before, but I didn't talk about it with you, so I want to get your thoughts. Yeah, now CM Punk's what, 36, 37, something like that? Yeah, Jason's what? Is <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure JDF is a bit over 40. He's 42, I believe. Just like 42, maybe 43 ish. Let me see. And JDF would beat the dog snot <laughs> out of CM Punk. Probably, man. I mean, there's a martial artist. Not out of CM Punk. Yeah, I mean, JDF has been doing this shit for you know thirty years, maybe longer. He, he, that's his life. He's yeah. been fighting. 
And but I mean the reason why it honestly for me makes sense that they could make that fight. He's one and zero in regular MMA, but he's competed in very high profile amateur MMA fights as well and won them all. Five and zero yeah. if you can, if you add yeah. up all of his records, but he's one and zero in professional. Yeah. He hasn't lost yet, and he's you know he's been doing combat sports. He's he's not a guy that's played somebody that fights somebody on that fights people on TV all his life. That wasn't his career. You know, he got he got the job because he could actually fight. Yeah. He got the job from Power Rangers because he can actually do that shit. They didn't have to get stunt guys to do it. You know? Yeah, he's been competing in judo for two years now, a purple belt yeah. in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and a seventh degree black belt in karate. <laughs> yeah, so he 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 really fights. <laughs> yeah. See if Punk does not really fight. He plays one on. He played one on TV. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I that's the that I mean, I <laughs> only because I'm a fan of him because of obvious reasons. But um, you know, it's just uh, I I just personally would like to see, you know, Jason get back in the cage. It doesn't have to be in the UFC. I would just like to see him come back and do it. But yeah, he's 41, so I understand why he doesn't. But you know, having the credentials that he does. Uh, I, I do believe he would beat CM Punk, so that's probably why the UFC is ignoring all of Jason's, you know, because uh, he's been on Instagram and and Facebook, and he's been calling for that fight since CM Punk got signed. And um, so yeah, I mean, every other week or so, you'll just see him post a video, CM Punk, where you at? Da 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 da. da. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's uh. He does, yeah, I mean, he really wants that fight. I mean, it, it, uh, all of his loyal fans are, of course, calling for it. And he, it's CM Punk's even been asked uh, at a Q&A, and he said, uh, you know, um, you know, whoever the UFC gives me, I'll take it. <laughs> and so, you know, but I don't see the UFC giving him. I think they know that if Frank... Um, yeah, if JDF gets in there, CM Punk even knows. He wants no, no parts to that fight. Yeah. He, he doesn't. He, no way in his right mind would he want that fight. Because uh-huh. he's guaranteed to lose. Yeah. Or like a freak injury or something to the JDF. JDF beats the dog shit out of him. Yeah. Plus, I mean, and that would only be if CM Punk fought at middleweight. Because uh, Jason David Frank in his professional fight... Uh, weighed at like 208 pounds. So I mean, if he right. can if he can drop down to that, you know, I mean, for as old as he is, that might be hard. Yeah. But, uh, but I mean, if he keeps if he's continuously been asking for that fight, he must be confident that he can. So, and I'm sure he could. He's a he's a healthy looking dude still in his age. Um, and I'm sure he will be for a while, being the the you know athlete that he is. Yeah. We'll see. I don't know. We'll see what happens. As far as your question. Um, this is at um, Junk212, two. <laughs> spelled 2, which is funny. Um, to your question, as far as I, I, I don't know when CM Punk will fight. Uh, I'm sure it'll be a few, quite a few more months, a couple more seasons will pass before he fights. Um, as far as uh, how he'll do, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm sure his ground game is top-notch. He's been doing jiu-jitsu for, according to him, almost a decade now, so... I'm sure his ground game is pretty – it would, would probably be impressive, but uh, I'm sure his striking needs work, and I'm sure he needs a lot more work. He's definitely at the right camp, I will say. Being at Rufus Sport is probably one of the best choices he could have made for a fight camp. So um, we'll see. I don't know. We'll see when the time comes. Next question. John Jones versus Kane, do you ever see this fight happening? And if so, say it happens in a year, how do you see John Jones and Kane going down? I don't, I don't even think John Jones is going to be Johnson, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know. <laughs> I don't. I, I'm not sure if John Jones even beats Kane, to be honest, though. Yeah, we'll see, but that, you know, it's just more to my point. I think Kane presents a. a a different challenge in that that the same argument that I have for Johnson beating him is the same argument I have for Kane. Jones has never fought a guy like Kane, a guy that can go five rounds harder than say Gustafson or Rashad or or uh, Glover or Daniel. Those guys went five rounds with John, right? 
Those yeah. guys slowed down or gave up, you know. And John Jones is actually the best fourth round fighter I think I've ever seen at light heavyweight because a lot of his wins or a lot of his comeback moments or a lot of his highlights come from the fourth round. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that means that just shows you that Jones, when he needs to, he can pick it up in, in the championship rounds. He's got a good tank on him. But Kane, man, at all times in all rounds, that guy's got a tank. So I think – that presents a different challenge in that Jones would – he would really prefer to get it out of there as quick as he could if he can. If he can't, you know, there may be a limit that Kane can push him that Jones has never hit before where he gets tired and he gets pushed and the wrestling becomes a factor for Jones because still Jones has only ever been taken down once. And that's by Gustafson and he didn't keep him there for too long. Um, you know, I think a guy like Kane could take him down and I think he could also keep him there. And uh, you've seen what he's done to guys like Bigfoot and and guys like uh, Junior on the ground. He's a he's a you know he's not to be fucked with there. If he's on top of you, especially if he's standing over you, you're in deep shit. Um, that's a, I I would say if that fight happens a year from now, uh, barring any injury from Kane at this point, because he really is gonna have to deal with some ring rust come UFC 188, I believe, where he fights for Doom for the unified belt at this point. Um, yeah. Say Kane stays injury free, you know, wins his fight with Verdum, fights whoever they line him up with next, and then fights Jones. Uh, if that fight, and I hope it's because Johnson sends him packing up there. Um, <laughs> um, I would think that uh, Kane really, uh, really, really gives him a, a lesson in in why Kane is who he is. I think Kane is a different type of machine than Jones has ever dealt with. Um, more so than any fighter, including Johnson, who he'll fight. Because I believe Johnson does have a tank, but I also believe that that tank will run out far before uh, Jones will. That's why he's really got to pace himself and probably get it out as quick as he can. I think if it gets past the third, Johnson's in real trouble. Um, but yeah. So that's the thing is that, you know, Jones has never fought a guy with a tank Kane, is ha Kane has – and uh, or the 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 heavy wrestling that Kane has. It's, I mean, if like the Kane uh, that fought Bigfoot comes out and fights Jones, I think Kane wins. Uh, you know, that <laughs> I don't I don't think that that um, he'll have much problem. Kane's also very good about movement. You remember that second fight where he was just that movement man. That second fight with Junior Dos Santos. I mean, yeah. Did you yeah, say the way that guy moved around to not get hit? The head there. movement, the footwork. Footwork, the angles. Jones is going to be in trouble if he comes looking like that and then he gets him down looking like he did against Bigfoot. If he could put all of the, some of the best things about his skill set together in one fight against Jones, oh, yeah, Jones, yeah, Jones, Jones doesn't tough. win. No. Yeah, Jones would be tough, especially if he boxed him the way that he boxed JDS. JDS, everybody was saying JDS had the best boxing at a heavyweight. And Kane outstruck the hell out of him. Well, he did it because he was able – well, I mean, in one sense, he did drop Junior, um, where I guess you could say he outboxed him there. Uh, most of the rest of it was because he was able he, – he, he scared Junior into thinking he was going to put him against the cage or get a takedown and stuff. But, yeah, his striking is top-notch, undoubtedly, undoubtedly. Yeah. And yeah. But the thing is, yeah, I mean, the reason he got knocked out by Junior was because he didn't look like that. in the sec That second fight with Junior, that's a totally different guy. Moving around, and he was injured. He, you know, I mean, whether that had anything to do with it, you know, who knows? But um, that just, you know, there are, there are levels of Kane where if he comes out looking like how he did against JDS two or three or Bigfoot in either fight, um, then he's in trouble. And so, you know, that that's this is all obviously hypothetical, considering you've asked us to put a time frame on when that fight would happen. It might take a couple more years for that to happen. So. Say it happens in two or three years, maybe it benefits Jones a little, especially if Kane continues to roll up injuries and stuff. So, um, but we're just going by the hypothetical given to us. But yeah, Kane probably wins that in a year if that were to happen. My opinion. That your final opinion? Yeah, I might have to say Kane wins that one. Right. Third question from Ashley Guerra at Ashley Guerra. I hope I said that right. If I didn't, I'm sorry. Um, who do you think is the most exciting fighter both inside the UFC and outside? And if so, who would you like to match up if they're in the same division? 
That's a weird question. Yeah. Because <laughs> if they're not in the same division, then it doesn't make sense. But it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we could do it by division if you want to do that. But, you know, that's kind of hard. Um, let's just go down from, like, heavyweight. Any heavyweights you're excited about seeing fight and outside the UFC? Probably not. Outside the UFC? Outside the UFC. Um, for me, Bobby Lashley. Uh, I enjoy watching him fight. Um, him and uh, – oh, what's his name? Uh, Vega. His last name is Ve- – uh, he fights for Bellator, and I can't remember his name. Yeah, I, you know. He's exciting to watch, though. I know who light heavyweight is. It's now Liam McGeary. Yeah, it's I'll definitely Liam McGeary. For light heavyweight, Liam McGeary. Light heavyweight in the UFC, Anthony Johnson. Um, For me. What about yeah. you? Yeah. What about you? I agree with that. I mean, Johnson, you know, ever since he came back and put those hands on Phil Davis, he's definitely been the most exciting to watch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I'd say at middleweight. Inside and outside the UFC. Try outside. Oh. It kind of you know helps you figure out inside pretty easy. Um, yeah, for, outside. Uh, uh, Schlemenko comes to mind. Um, Joe Schilling also per- comes to mind Schilling, too. Yeah. Uh, Joe Schilling, Alexander Schlemenko. Uh. David Branch, kind of. He's really grown a really good boxing style. Um, speaking of which, I mean, we didn't get to talk about the fact that he's going up to light heavyweight, but we'll talk about that later. Um, yeah. But, yeah, for me, I would say probably Joe Schilling. That's not it. I mean, you know, he's he's got some time to really work that too. But just as far as watching him in general, uh, both in MMA and kickboxing, the dude is a beast. I mean, uh he always puts on exciting fights, especially kickboxing fights. If you haven't seen a Joe Schilling glory kickboxing bout, yeah. you need to go yeah. on YouTube right now and get that yeah. done. Just so you know. Yep. For me, uh, inside the UFC, at middleweight, uh, all time I would say Chris Lieben, but I'm sure she meant uh, right now. Uh, by the way, if Liam McGeary and Anthony Johnson fought, you know, I think you all know who it was. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh oh! Exciting heavyweight in the UFC. I would actually say Mark Hunt. Yeah. Yeah, Mark Hunt, or you know, believe it, I like Travis Brown a lot. Yeah, he's pretty. Oh, definitely too. I mean, I that like dude, Travis that Brown. dude uh, has a switch on him. I swear, when he gets yeah, in there, know. there's a different level of violence. He just ups the ante too sometimes. Yeah. I like Travis Brown a whole lot of heavyweight. Yeah, so then if I were to use my picks, Mark Hunt versus Bobby Lashley. <laughs> That's a weird fight, huh? Yeah, it is. Huh, who would win that? Probably Mark Hunt, maybe, I think. You know, I think that Bobby Lashley would try and get him down, and I honestly think that he could. Um, but, you know, Hunt has decent takedown defense, but it's just that Lashley is one of these guys that's so strong. <laughs> um, I know Mark is also strong, but it's just a matter of, you know, Hmm. I don't think any. I don't think any man alive can take a a real punch from Mark Hunt. No, no, I mean, probably not. No. Um. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Is that if uh, Bo- and Bobby Lashley striking still needs work, so I'm leaning on if he can't get Hunt down to the ground, it's Hunt's fight. Um, yeah. Especially Hunt with his leg kicks and you know um, his and that right hand. Yeah, oh, I and mean, his oh. fat. I mean, he's fast. He's got fast hands for the size and and you know. The real weight that he's at for him to move his hands as fast as he can is really scary. <laughs> yeah, it is. You wouldn't see it coming sometimes. Right. Um, and, that, so, and it's just so powerful. So powerful. Yeah, so with Mark Hunt versus Bobby Lashley, which are my two, and according to your question, if I were to pit them against each other, I would say Mark Hunt wins that. Um, then we'll move, and then I already we already talked about Johnson and Liam McGarry. So I think what's our what's our final poll on middleweight here? If I'm gonna go with Shlomenko and then go with the, I will go with Shlomenko because he probably poses a better chance against whoever I pick for middleweight right now. My my immediate thought is Weidman. He is exciting to watch. Um, let me think. Talis Ladies is another guy is exciting to watch. The most exciting at middleweight in the UFC right now. Who is that? Hmm. Uh, Vitor's kind of up there. Jacare is up there. Man, fucking middleweight. Rock. 
Rockhold. Yeah, fuck. This division, man. I'll say most exciting to watch. There's so many now. <laughs> if I pick Weidman, it's obviously Weidman that wins that. Uh, if I pick Jacare against Lomenko, I would also say Jacare. I mean, I mean, if 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 Bensley who or yeah, Bensley, the middleweight champ of Bellator right now, could submit Shlomenko, then Jacare surely could. So that'll be my pick. Who's who's your pick for middleweight in the UFC? Most exciting. Yeah, here's another one. That's a dude, man, who brings it. Yeah, I like Joel Romero a lot. Mm -hmm. God, middleweight has become so exciting, too. It's kind of weird. I was kind of brushing under. Most of those fights going out, going down in April, though, so when the time comes, middleweight's going to be the talk of the town around April. So we'll move down to well to wait. Wait, did you pick one? Did you pick Yoel? I didn't know. Yeah, I'm picking Yoel. Yo, well, not a bad choice. I think he, if Tito could ragdoll Shlomenko the way he did with his wrestling, I'm pretty sure that Yoel could too. So I got to say Yo, Yoel in your case. And then we'll move down to welterweight. For me, yeah, most ex- yeah, for me, welterweight, hmm. exciting outside. Exciting outside. Hmm. The welterweight champ. A bell tour. Who is that? Lima? Yeah, it's Lima. Uh, Lima's pretty exciting. Paul Daly, probably. For me. Outside the UFC? Well, yeah, I'll go with Paul Daly. You're, like, breaking up here. Oh, am I? Hold on. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. All right, cool. Um... We'll move down to welterweight. Uh, I was saying my favorite outside of the UFC at welterweight probably got to be Paul Daly. That's the one that comes to mind off the top of my head. Um, What about you? Uh, Paul Daly looked really awesome uh, last week. Yeah. So, you know, hey, I I can't really – Name anybody else that's doing more at 170 outside of the UFC right now. Yeah. I mean, and which is crazy because it seems like the UFC has a monopoly on exciting 170 fighters. Uh, take your pick. You've got Robbie Lawler, Roy geez. McDonald, Tyron Woodley, uh, you know, Johnny Hendricks, Matt Brown. Fudge, good luck. Gosh. Who's, who's the most exciting out of that bunch? <laughs> oh, shit. That's, that's too hard to call, really. I mean, Off the top of my head, Robbie comes to mind, so I'll just go with Robbie. Either Robbie or Matt Brown for me. Yeah, I'll, I'll go with Robbie. And then so if Robbie and Paul Daly fought, holy shit, can you imagine? <laughs> or if, Robbie and, or if uh, Matt Brown and Paul Daly fought, that would be sick. <sighs> Paul Daly had some sick hands. But oh, can't, man, I know. Can you imagine? Could you imagine that, that fight? Ugh. Yeah. Oh. That gives me just a mind fuck just thinking about that fight. That would be great. I like it. I like that. Paul Daly and Robbie, in which case I would say Robbie probably wins based on better cardio. Um, if it's a five-round fight, if it's a three-round fight, who knows? It could be closer. Um, I would say Robbie wins that, yeah. Who is yours? Matt Brown, did you say? Yeah, Matt Brown, dude. Who would you who would you pick between? That's probably a much closer matchup. Who would you pick between Matt Brown and Paul Daly? Oh God, I don't know, man. I'm <laughs> going with Matt Brown because you just can't stop him. Can't stop. Yeah. Plus, that's another guy that can push the cardio issue, you know. And if he can, yeah. you know, and uh, and you know, there are points to where Paul Daly, you know. I don't think he has a cardio issue per se, but, you know, there are times where, of course, he's blown his wad and gotten tired and kind of came back but still, you know, seemed tired. So, I mean, if he seems tired at all in that fight with Brown, which he possibly probably could be, I think Brown would take over and probably get a late finish in that fight. So I'll go with that. I think uh, Matt Brown wins that too. It seems that every fighter in the UFC is beating the fighters outside, right? (laughs) 
I think yeah. the, the closest one for me was probably the uh, probably either that Paul Daly Matt Brown one or the Bobby Lashley Matt Mark Hunt one, only because of Lashley's wrestling. Uh, lightweight, and we'll probably stop at lightweight. We don't need to go any farther. But lightweight, uh, most exciting, as I said, probably Anthony Pettis. Uh, and then outside of the UFC, I would say Gaethje. Who? Pretty, pretty easy for me. Who, Justin Gaethje or Will Brooks? No, Justin Gaethje. Will Brooks is pretty exciting, but I think Gaethje is more exciting. Gaethje is yeah. more aggressive. Yeah. And effective with his aggressiveness. You know what I mean? Like, he comes forward. When he's trying to hit you with as hard as he can, he's trying to aim it, too, which is hard to do, but he gives it a shot. <laughs> and uh, and that doesn't stop him from putting combinations together, either. Uh, he's got decent footwork. I think, uh, you know, Pettis being Pettis, I think he's much better on the ground. And, you know, while, while uh, Gaethje is uh, aggressive, he would need to be a little mild in that fight against Pettis, you know, um, which... To me, it would be hard for Gaethje to do, but at the same time, you know, if he if he does follow that, it would he would need to be very careful and coordinated in the sense that he can't let Pettis um, tee off because he's great at countering. I don't know if you saw the Gilbert fight for anybody that saw it, he could counter. <laughs> Pettis isn't a yep. guy that just because he comes forward and does crazy shit doesn't mean if he's going backward, he won't still try to do some crazy shit. You know what I mean? Yeah, I hear you. So I'd got to go with uh, Anthony Pettis there and winning the fight if they, if him and Gaethje fought. But that would be cool. That would be awesome. <laughs> I love doing these fantasy matchup fights. That would be crazy. But it also breaks my heart because who knows if it will ever happen. Right. <laughs> right. World Series of Fighting knows they made a star out of Gaethje. They probably want to hold on to him for quite a while longer. Who knows if he'll ever see the UFC. But – I'm sure he'd be at least making some money staying there. So as long as he's making his money, I don't really mind at the same time. Um, so we'll end with that question. We have one other one. This, uh, this is kind of silly, but there's two more, and then we'll probably close out. Uh, your three favorite fighters of all time. Not too hard. Of all time? All time. Okay. Uh, Anderson Silva. Wow. Even though he did get Papa Roy's, and I hate him for that. Even even though he did, I'm surprised at that answer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anderson Silva. Um, who else? I'll say one. Um, for me, Anthony Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> if it uh, hasn't been said enough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Top three, Anderson Silva. Um. I'll say my second one, Pat Curran. DJ Penn. Good one. And, uh, shoot. Gosh, it's so hard. There's so many to For me, uh, Chris Lieben, that's my third. I was say, because I have a top five, so I had to take two out, and so I'm going to go with Chris Lieben. Chris Lieben, Pat Curran, Anthony Johnson for me. All-time favorites. Wow. Yeah. Anderson Silva. Gosh, it's just too many to pick from, man. I, I know. To give us three? That's how I say it's almost evil. I hope you know this. Know. Chuck Liddell's a good one. I was wondering if you were going to pick him. Yeah. That's not a bad one. I got a picture of him at ESC 184. That was awesome. Dude was cool. Yeah. He'll never hear this, but if Chuck Liddell, you know, he was cool at the just quick story about him. He uh he was supposed to dip like thirty minutes after uh the after like at a certain point and then he stayed a half hour longer to talk to to more fans. And security wow. yeah, I mean uh, well not to talk but like to do pictures and stuff because there was a huge line to go take pictures and stuff and, and it was already a huge line when I got in there to just to go take right. a picture with him. And uh they told him he was supposed to leave and he said, "Now nah, I'll kick back for another half hour." And uh, wow. so, props to him for that. That's uh, you know, not, Chuck Liddell's a man. Bad. Not bad. Mm -hmm. Good guy. Good guy, Chuck. Is that your third? You gonna awesome. stick with that? Yeah. Chuck Liddell, B.J. Penn, Anderson Silva. I love it. Not bad. No, you can't go back wrong with those choices. I love my choices I like yours. Those are good ones. Final question. The rampage issue. Oh lord. Yeah. 
with Rampage getting uh, sued by Bell, I don't know if it's getting sued, but um, with Rampage getting sued by Bellator to come fight back for them, do you see him making the UFC 186 pay per view, or does he get uh, taken back to Bellator? Uh, that could have been worded better. First of all, secondly, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Rampage, I. I don't know. I really have a hard time believing that the UFC wouldn't have done, you know, its due diligence in making sure that all their all the all the, you know, right circumstances were were handled to get him to sign a contract for the UFC. I have a hard yeah. time, you know. Yeah, I would think the UFC would say, "All right, get some lawyers on this and make sure that, you know, he's perfectly fine." And Rampage, according to him, has stated that because the UFC or I mean Bellator for that one inaugural uh, inaugural pay-per-view that they did that he fought on, he didn't get paid his pay-per-view points money. And because of that, he felt they were in violation of his contract. And because they violated it, they had, according to him, uh, 40 days or something to respond to him uh, and his management asking what happened to that money. Bellator, according to Rampage, again, all of this according to Rampage, um, they didn't pay him his money. Uh, they breach and in which he says is in his contract. They breached that part of his contract in paying him that money, meaning that the contract is no longer void. Along right. with the fact that because the contract is no longer void, he doesn't have to wait a whole six months for uh, for a promotion to sign him, and then Bellator makes a counteroffer kind of deal. Because that's how most contracts are. If a fighter wants to fight somewhere else. Um, the, the promotion that they're fighting for has the rights to, you know, say, Hey, we'll pay you the same amount that they're willing to pay you. You know, the same, the same kind of issue was going on with, with Eddie Alvarez for the longest time. Um, but this is different in that they breached that part of the contract, according to Rampage, that he didn't get paid that money. Bellator says they, he got paid that money. And if he did get paid that money, if Bellator can prove that he got paid that money, then his contract is still, um, is still valid, and then yeah, he will not fight on that 186 card if that's the case. And and uh, the what sucks for the UFC is that um, Bellator was I don't know if they were even being you know, they, they did this on purpose, but the 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 court date for which they're gonna take their, which Bellator takes Rampage to court to prove their side of you know the story here um, is gonna be two weeks away from 186. Which, if they prove themselves right and Rampage's contract is still valid, that means that the fight will be taken away two weeks prior to the event, which is you know shitty for UFC. As I said, I believe the UFC did the due diligence here and uh, you know maybe checked his payments or his bank or something, something um, to make sure that it was okay to sign him back over. You know, uh, they made a big pageantry of it of signing him back over. You know. Uh, giving him a portion of time during an event to you know, interview him and say, "Hey, I'm back." Da 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 da. So I don't know. I, I you know that's my personal thing on it. Uh, I think that that Bellator maybe messed up there and just didn't get. Damn, you know. Um, whether that was on purpose or whatever's going on, I'm not gonna speculate on that just now. But I I, I tend I, I'm I'm kind of believing Rampage here. I don't think that he would just say this and then the UFC would sign him and, you know, all this other stuff that's going on. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't I don't think uh I'm I'm not sure if Bellator has a leg to stand on. If everything that Rampage is saying is the truth, then yeah, Bellator is screwed. Yeah, no, they're not getting him back. Yeah, they're not getting him back and they're just grasping at straws to try and, you know, stop Rampage from going where he wanted to go and make his money. Yeah, and what would suck too is that this isn't a ju this is a, 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 a judicial court where they're going to take him um, because they say he's violating his contract. They're not suing him, you know. They're they're saying he's in violation of his contract, and they just want to render that their contract is, is still valid. That's really all they're taking him to this court for. What sucks yeah, about it? Make no, go ahead. Yeah, all they're trying to do is just make Rampage not fight for the UFC. Yeah. That's why I'm thinking, like, they could take him to this court and they could say, they could, you know, take some of his words and misconstrue them in a sense. And then it becomes a long, stretched out process. And if, and, and then they can make a court rule him, um, 
you know, they can make a court say, yeah, you can't get your fighter's license until we figure this out. If that's the case on this on this day, especially if it's two weeks away, he's probably not going to be able to get licensed for that fight. In which case, Bellator, you guys are assholes <laughs> if you're doing that. You know what I mean? That's just my two cents. I don't want to believe Bellator is being stupid like that. I don't, you know, because I still want to believe that Coker's a good dude and he's not being an asshole here. Um, um, and even if, and maybe it's not even him pulling the strings. Maybe it's Viacom. Who knows? I mean, I don't know all the things. So that's why I'm not speculating right now. I'm not saying anything bad about anybody. I'm just saying if that's the case, Bellator, uh, the you know, then you guys suck. <laughs> Come on now. It's been, it gets crazy, you know. Um, I will say this. I saw recently all of the, you know, B Jackson did get paid a lot to fight on that pay per view. He got paid a, he, first of all, he got paid a car and a buttload of money. He made about a half a mil on the, on his, you know, on his paint, you know, his, uh, what does they call that? You know, the, the payment they did to get right off the bat for competing. Um, oh. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, the show. yeah, you know, your show money. He got paid that, and he won, so he got paid uh, over a half a mil, and he got a new car. So uh, he got paid a lot, <laughs> but you know, again, it's your, it's somebody's money, and of course, if you're not getting paid all of what you're promised, you, uh, you know, no matter what, you'll be upset about it. That being said, he did get paid a lot, so. <laughs> But um, now he's fighting for the UFC. I'm sure he's got a badass contract with them now. He might get another car after fighting for them. <laughs> Who knows? Um, but no, I, whatever the case, I just hope he's able to fight. I, you know, it's, it's what he wants to do. Let him fight. It's it's kind of ridiculous to stop him from doing that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Any final thoughts? Anything you want to bring up? Anything you want to talk to me about? Uh, you know, um. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about Scott Coker, to be honest with you. Mm. Uh, I just want to have hope that this guy can steer him in the right direction. Thus far, I've heard nothing but good things from fighters except Rampage. Um, yeah, so. yeah, that's true. But, I mean, here's the thing. The guy, you know, is he a better businessman than Bjorn Rebney? Sure. Sure he is. Agreed. Um, but, gosh, I mean, yeah. I saw when he, you know, when Strikeforce was still on, he still does this whole, you know, professional wrestling WWE shtick with his, with his promotions. I, I'm not sure if that's the right way to go, man. Who's, who, Coker? Yeah. In what sense? You know, just creating all these, you know. Oh, like the Stefan Bonner, Tito Ortiz Stephen thing? Stefan Bonner, Tito Ortiz thing. Yeah. Or back in Strikeforce with, you know, Mayhem Miller jumping in after, uh, uh, Shields beat Anderson. I'm not so sure that uh, Coker allowed that, much less I think that was just Miller being an idiot and jumping in there himself. From what I understand, I just heard that, you know, at the same time, I'm sure he enjoyed that. <laughs> um, but, you know, who knows? If Coker's behind this, which I don't think he is, even if it is what Bellator's doing, but I don't know that for sure yet. Like I said, nobody does. Um, we'll wait until the court day to really see what Bellator is real. Um, intentions are it, hey there's a chance that they could prove that rampage is you know is is in the wrong here and maybe not even in the wrong maybe there's a misunderstanding or something um but uh, unless that money made its way to rampages to a uh, bank account they're, they're they're probably not i don't see how they would stop him unless they decided to make it a, a long-term process which would be pretty shitty it'd be on the same grounds of what they were doing to eddie alvarez which you know was already a fucked up thing to do in the first place yeah, but, yeah that was a mess yeah so if they do that with rampage it's an even bigger mess i feel you know um so we'll see i mean you're just hurting yourself if you make it like that i don't think and like i said we said this on the last podcast they don't really need rampage you know that overall, at the end, would it help to have Rampage on the roster? Oh, yeah, sure. You get more viewers that way. But in the long term, it's not it's not going to help. Who knows how much longer he's in the game for anyway. Second, secondly, you know, you're building stars. You got Liam McGarry now. Start worrying about him. Start building him up. Start, you know, building other light heavyweights up. Start finding them, you know, 
finding the new local talent that's coming on up and then, you know, getting them, making sure they don't go to the UFC, making sure, and then, you know, promoting those guys, building them up once they make names for themselves inside of your cage and, uh, and, and then promote them. Right. You know, don't Will Brooks them. Right. Exactly. 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 Any other uh, subjects you want to touch before you head on out here? That's really it, man. Yeah. That's all I've got. It's been a weird week, you know, not too much going on, and, and again, we said without an MMA this weekend, it's been uh, quite kind of odd, right? <laughs> it's been a while. Yeah. Um, Why? Yep. We'll this has been a back fun. Out of that for, uh, next week, though. Yeah, uh, for sure. We have another episode coming on on Wednesday. Jo- uh, Jonas, of course, you're welcome if you're able to make it. Um, we will be talking more in depth about the 185 card and whatever news hits the MMA world between now and Wednesday. (laughs) With that being said, fight fans, thank you guys for listening. We appreciate you. I know we kind of dragged this one out a little bit, but it's nonchalant and we hope we talked about some cool subjects. We think we did. Um, this was awesome. Episode 25. Here's to another 25 more. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Jonas, awesome having you on again. If you want to hit us up, hit me up on Twitter. You can hit me up at Nick the Phantom, my Twitter handle. Uh, Jonas, you can just message the Facebook MMA discussion page if you want to talk to him, and I'll let him know because he doesn't check that shit. And uh, <laughs> and uh, just so you know, Fight Fans, again, hit up Sports of Anarchy. We're kind of uh, doing our own little remodeling with it in the sense that we don't bring so much uh, – News per se, as we bring uh, these awesome blogs and articles that really touch in depth with what's going on, more so than news, because news hits so fast and we're not able to get it on there as quickly. Uh, but Sports of Anarchy is growing with uh, with every few days that goes by, and we appreciate every viewer. Hit us up also on Twitter at sportsofanarchy.com or or just at sportsofanarchy on Twitter. My bad. Um, again, hit us up on Facebook, especially all our all our good stuff is there. We love you guys. We appreciate you. Hit up our sponsors. With that being said, Jonas, say say goodbye. Peace out, y'all. Peace.